Okay, welcome back to the second lecture for this afternoon. Um, I just want to uh, start by extending a big thank you to all the people who provided, again, such a wonderful afternoon tea. Um, they do do a marvellous job, all of their, you know, in their own time. I think that um, it's um, greatly appreciated by everyone that's here. Okay, before I launch into the actual lecture itself, just a one thing that I wanted to clarify with everyone. Most of you will be aware that Augustus, over the course of his life, <coughs> had several name, name changes. So today I will use the name Octavian when I'm talking uh, about him prior to 27 BC, and Augustus when I'm referring to him after 27 BC. And it is important, and you'll see as the lecture goes on why. When my comments are sort of fairly general in nature, um, I will use just Augustus. So I hope that's not too confusing, but it is, it is important. Okay, in 31 BC, Octavian defeated Mark Antony and Cleopatra at the Battle of Actium. While this was not the end of the pair, it did mark the point where Octavian could be considered the most powerful individual in the Roman world. He was the last man standing in the civil wars that had racked Rome for many years. After Actium, Octavian's army now incorporated all those soldiers who had fought on the side of Antony, as well as the many legions that had obviously fought on his side. So there was really no one who was in any position to challenge his uh, position. However, even though militarily he may have been in an undisputed position of preeminence, Octavian found himself in a very tricky political situation. Roman attitudes to sole rulers or monarchs was not very good. The idea of kingship was an abhorrence at Rome. The accusation that someone was aiming at kingship was one of the worst political insults you could hurl at your opponent. The Gracchi brothers had been suspected of aiming at tyranny and they had both been assassinated. Julius Caesar had attained a quasi-kingship and he had also been assassinated. So Octavian had to be very careful about how he presented his own position of um, eminence. The top of the Roman political pyramid could be a very dangerous place. But at the same time, Octavian had absolutely no intention of giving up the power and the position that he had fought so hard to, um, to attain. So what did Octav um, Augustus do? Well, briefly, he deployed what could be arguably described as one of the most sophisticated propaganda campaigns in the, w the world had ever seen and managed to sell one of the most astute political solutions that the world had ever seen and came up with a system that endured for another uh, 500 or so years. Now, there are many components to this program, and obviously in 45 minutes I can't talk about all of them in any great detail. The focus of this lecture will be his use of art and architecture to sell his Prinkaput or his new political system. So what then was the message that Augustus tries to convey with his use of art and architecture? Briefly, he wants to make sure that everyone knows that he is the bringer of peace and prosperity to the Roman world, something that many people would have appreciated after the turmoil of the civil wars. Second, he needed to justify that he was the right man to rule Rome, and not just because he had the biggest and most powerful army, or the, the only army really at that time, but because he had the right credentials for the job. He was the right man to rule. And third, that it would only be through the continued uh, family rule, through his family continuing to rule at Rome, that peace and prosperity could endure into the future. Okay, so to begin with, let us look at how Augustus chose to portray himself to the Roman people and to the people of the empire. Now, during the Republican period, in their portraiture, the Romans had a taste for realism. I think this is a bit like the selfies of today, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, 
they, and this is really where artists take a bit of a warts and all approach to the, to the subject. And even the smallest details of the surface of the skin with all its imperfections and all its lines and wrinkles and warts and what have you is included in the portrait. These details were combined with an interest in uh, bone structure and musculature. Now, early portraits of Augustus, the ones that were done uh, early on in his, his life, tend to follow this general pattern. Uh, for example, on the denarius of Octavian and Mark Antony, which was released about 41 BC, and on this denarius uh, struck sometime between 32 and 29 BC. And in this portrait bust of Oct Octavian, and in this bust, uh, the young Caesar is portrayed with um, a, a fairly bony face, uh, small eyes, they almost look um, deceivious some, in, some, in some way, um, and a generally nervous type expression. It captures something of the ambitious and power hungry young man that he certainly was. However, about the time that Octavian received the title Augustus, so 27 BC, a new portrait must have been created for him to take the place of this early, emotional, youthful portrait type. The new portrait was unlike anything that had been found in the late Republican portraiture. It expresses Augustus's new... This is the, 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 the selfie that's been photoshopped, yeah? <laughs> to, to a huge extent. Now, this, um, this new portrait expresses Augustus's new image of himself or how he imagined himself as Augustus and how he identified himself with this new title. Now, we don't know who actually commissioned any individual statue or portrait um, that employed this portrait type, but you have to feel that the original must have been designed with Augustus's approval um, or even at his own insistence that he decided how he was going to be represented and someone made a, um, the original uh, idea for it. Now, it's equally obvious that the chosen sculptor was working from a set of prerequisites which dictated style and overall concept. In place of what we saw before, this bony and irregular features um, in Octavian's portraiture, this new type of um, sculpture is marked by a harmony of proportions. Gone is the ruthlessly realistic portrait of the late Republic. The face is now characterised by a very calm, elevated expression. The spontaneous turn of the head in the youthful portrait has given way to a timeless and remote dignity. Instead of the tousled hair over the forehead, we now get a sort of symmetry, a certain evenness in his, in his hair. Um, and the new portrait is almost intellectual, in some respects. Um, Zanka describes it as being sort of a quite an intellectual and artificial portrait. It's, a, it's an ageless classical beauty, really. Now, certainly the mood might vary from the grim determination of the Capitoline Augustus, fashioned at a time before the total consolidation of his position, through to the sombre octoritas of Augustus as Pontifex Maximus, to the supremely self-confident prima porta Augusta, where the emperor, with an expansive gesture, harangues an unseen populace. And we'll have a closer look at this one in just a moment. However, the overriding impression of a determined, efficient, authoritative leader is common to all. Moreover, all surviving representations of Augustus shows him as a young man. And so to his subjects, he must have seemed eternally young. Most people throughout the Roman Empire would never have had the opportunity to see Augustus, but their vision of him would have been this sort of thing, a young, um, idealised, vigorous, healthy young man. Um, and this was not only on his statutory, 
uh, portraits, but obviously also on his coinage too. Now this portrait enjoyed enormous success and it was copied in vast numbers in every part of the empire. So that every corner of the Roman world would be systematically bombarded with the image of the princeps. This new portrait type is indeed the visual equivalent of the title Augustus in some respects, as it exploits all the best possible associations of the name. Augustus's extraordinary position in the Roman state is here defined in art. Now Augustus, you have to think, knew what he was doing. I don't know, it just, was it just a fluke? Or did he know what he was doing? I don't know, I get the feeling that he probably did. And even the ordinary people in the empire would have inferred such concepts as beautiful, ageless, thoughtful, and dignified when they looked upon this um, portrait type. Now perhaps one of the most famous uh, portraits of Augustus, um, many of you I'm sure are familiar with it, would be the, uh, known as the Prima Porta. And I was horrified when John told me in his Roman Art and Architecture uh, course many years ago now, that these, paint, these portraits were actually painted. They actually covered the marble up with the most horrible colours, uh, bright reds and blues and everything. And you just think, you just wouldn't do that to a piece of marble today, but um, they did do it in the, in the Roman period. Okay, now this one was po probably carved after Augustus's death, um, or it may have been a copy up from an earlier bronze statue. However, what it shows, again, is this handsome, idealised young youth um, in his prime. Now, the symbolism in this statue is quite remarkable. The bare feet indicate that Augustus is a hero, or perhaps even a god. Cupid riding the dolphin is a visual reference to the claim that the Julian dynasty had descended from the goddess Venus, mother of Cupid. And it is interesting to note that while Augustus declined to allow himself to be represented as a god, he does allow these very thinly disguised divine references to be used in this statue. Covering the breastplate that Augustus is actually wearing are reliefs that refer symbolically to various aspects of the emperor's propaganda program. In the centre, we have a Parthian, um, he's on your, your right, dressed in baggy trousers, and he's handing back uh, the Roman legionary standards to a, a Roman soldier, perhaps Augustus's stepson, Tiberius. Above this scene, the sky god holds up a canopy, signifying that peace implied by the victory scene and by the figure of Mother Earth holding a cornucopia full of fruit at the bottom of the breastplate is now spread throughout Augustus's empire. I'll show you the Mother Earth in, in, a, in a moment. Apollo and Diana, to the bottom left and right, are paralleled by the sun god Sol and the moon goddess Luna near the emperor's shoulders. Thus, the cosmic forces and passage of time are also included in this grand vision of Augustan peace. Now, remember some of these features because you'll see they reoccur again and again. Okay, let's move on from portraiture to some architecture. Now, even before the Battle of Actium, Octavian, it would seem, was already well aware of how important gestures could be in winning the hearts and the minds of the people. At the age of just 30, before he'd even won sole power, Octavian put up an enormous tomb monument to himself in Rome. Why would he do this so early? I mean, he'd, he'd hoped to live much longer than 30 and he hadn't even won sole power, but he decided to put up this monument, um, as I said, very early on. 
Well, when Octavian had publicly made known the contents of Antony's will, and in particular Antony's desire to be buried beside Cleopatra in Alexandria, he played on, Octa on Antony's supposed betrayal of Rome. So Octavian needed to show that he was different and that he would never abandon Rome for the East. And one way of doing this was to advertise that, you know, this is not just where I live, but this is where I'm going to die and this is where I'm going to be buried. And this said, he's saying here, I intend to st stay in Rome and I'm going to be buried in the capital. Now, we're not exactly sure when the construction of this mausoleum started, but we know by about 28 BC, work had progressed to the point where the large adjacent park could be open to the public. The mausoleum was the largest that had ever been built in Rome up to that time. It was slightly more than 90 metres in diameter and about 45 metres tall. No doubt dominating the northern end of the campus marshes where it was situated. The white travertine of the circular lower wall would have contrasted um, quite nicely with the evergreen shrubs and the trees planted, as I said, in the surrounding park. And in this spacious public park, um, the, the, the public obviously could come and spend time there, and while they were there, they would be uh, surrounded by statues and inscriptions of famous victories and I'm no doubt sure that some of those would have been Augustus's uh, statues and, and victories. Now, after Augustus's death, two bronze uh, square pillars were added on either side of the doorway, and on which was inscribed the text of Augustus's res gestae. Um, and this is a wonderful piece of political promotion in itself. Now let's move now from Augustus's mausoleum to temples. As early as 29 BC, a program of religious rebuilding was proclaimed. In his res gestae, which I've just mentioned was a marvellous piece of self-promotion, Augustus writes, quote, During my sixth consulate and by order of the Senate, I restored 82 temples of the gods in Rome and did not omit a single one which was at that time in need of renewal. Now this restoration fits in well with Augustus's overall program of religious revival. Indeed, one very important factor in Augustus's claim to have restored the Republic was a call for a reinvigorated piety and a return to traditional Roman religious beliefs. In accordance with his call for a return to increased piety, Augustus um, enhanced the status of various religious groups, he promoted the renewal of sacred ceremonies and he instituted many other rites. Now, revitalised religious events confirmed that life was beginning to return to normal after the civil wars, and it simultaneously gave the people something to do. You know, they got events to attend at temples and things, so it keeps people out of mischief. Now, to handle the expanded program of events, Augustus needed to not only restore and improve existing public venues, but he would have needed to add new ones as well. And no doubt many of Rome's temples would have been in a particularly sorry state after decades of neglect. Now, it would be impossible to look at all of the 82 temples that he restored, and we can't do that anyway. Um, so I just want to highlight a couple of the what I think are the, the more important ones. And I think these two will give you the general idea of the message that Augustus is trying to send. First would be the Temple of Apollo on the Palatine Hill. Now Augustus's relationship with the god Apollo was well established um, before he even built this temple. 
Augustan poets depict Apollo as playing a decisive role in, um, in the Battle of Actium. And his role at Actium fitted in with the way in which Augustus had this long claimed special relationship with the god. Now, although Augustus followed Roman tradition in dedicating a temple to commemorate a military victory, he didn't choose to locate the temple of Apollo on the field of Mars outside the city's religious boundary, as would have been customary, but instead he chose to build the temple on land that he had purchased on the Palatine Hill which just happened to be right next to his own house. Now, look, possibly, you have to give him the benefit of the doubt, possibly he had originally intended to um, use this land to extend his own house. It may have been, um, you know, for, for personal reasons to start with. But after the ground was struck by lightning, um, he decided to declare it public property and build a temple there instead. Now, a passageway actually connected Augustus's house with the forecourt of the temple. Now, the location of the temple and the connection between his house and the temple was actually very clever. Augustus was associating himself in a very direct manner with one of Rome's gods. But there is more. There always is, isn't there? Now... On becoming Pontifex Maximus, Augustus also dedicated part of his house as a shrine to Vesta, another very important Roman deity. Now, normally when a man was elected to the post of Pontifex Maximus, they would move into a house in the Roman Forum, which was situated next to the Temple of Vesta. But instead of occupying the official home of the Pontifex Maximus, Augustus chose to incorporate the temple into his own house. Consequently, the Augustan poet Ovid could speak of a single house holding three gods, Apollo, Vesta and Augustus. This action successfully inserted Augustus and his own home right into the centre of Roman religious, um, sorry, Roman religion and associated Augustus forever with these gods. Now, Augustus not only wanted to tie himself firmly to these gods, but he also wanted to set an example of religious piety. He writes again, quote, The statues of myself in the city, whether standing or on horseback, or in a quadriga, numbering 80 in all, and all of silver, I had removed. And from this money, I dedicated golden offerings in the temple of Apollo in my own name and in the name of those who had honoured me with these statues. Now, from the Roman biographer Suetonius, we learn that the golden offerings were in the form of tripods, now, these must have been very large and ornate and would have been an impressive visual testimony to Augustus's piety. This spectacular gesture of melting down so many of his own sculptures was, incidentally, a convenient opportunity for Augustus to get rid of anything that was old portraits. <laughs> um, you know, it's like going through the photograph album and tearing up the ones that you don't want to look at anymore. Um, and he, this was one way, look, you've got to be thinking all the time. That's what my dad always tells me, you've got to be thinking all the time. So it was a good way of getting rid of the statues, perhaps that didn't fit with his new style um, and his new image. Now, the second temple I was going to consider is the temple of the deified Julius Caesar. Now, this temple was decreed by the Senate uh, way back in 42 BC in acknowledgement of Caesar's apotheosis or his becoming a god. It was built at the eastern end of the Roman Forum where Caesar's body had been cremated. The temple appears long before its completion on coins that were issued at Rome in 36 BC. 
which depict on their obverse the head of Octavian. And if you notice, he's wearing, he's, he's shown here with a beard, which indicates that he's in mourning for Caesar. And on their reverse is the temple. Now, the temple itself was finally dedicated on the 18th of August, 29 BC, three days after Octavian celebrated a triple triumph. Now, in front of the temple uh, was a platform or a rostra, and on the sides and front of which were displayed the prayers of ships captured at Actium. In this way, this new rostra mirrored and rivaled the display on the Republican rostra situated opposite, which displayed the prayers of ships that were captured um, from the Carthaginians many years before. Egyptian booty was placed inside the temple. So Octavian, with this temple then, was not only honouring his adopted father, but he was tying himself very firmly with the memory of Caesar. In addition, he was reminding the people of Rome of his victory over the East. Now, one of Augustus's most important buildings would have to be um, the Augustan Forum. Now, this forum sends all manners of subtle political and ideological messages. The forum consists of a long, open piazza dominated at one end by the Temple of Mars the Avenger, which is, or Mars Altar, which is this here, and flanked by porticos, fairly obvious to see there, uh, with two large hemicycles on either side, one here and one there. Now, it was built to accommodate legal and business activities which were overflowing from the existing two fora. In the northwest hemicycle stood statues of Aeneas, surrounded by the kings of Alba Longa and ancestors of the Julian family, right down to the recently deceased Marcellus and the elder Drusus. Opposite was Romulus, flanked by military heroes of the Republic, responsible for securing Rome's empire. Two inscriptions accompanied each statue, a short one that just recorded the basic details and a longer one which related career honours and achievements in detail. In the centre of the piazza was a statue of Augustus in a triumphal chariot in his guise as father of the fatherland or pater patriae a title granted to him earlier in the same year the forum was dedicated. In addition, inscribed bases which perhaps supported gilded statues of personified provinces were set up by the provinces in his honour. Imitations of world conquest were on display in the form of two large paintings of Alexander the Great and were given a physical manifestation in the large variety of polychrome marble from all over the empire that was used in the forum's architecture. Now, at one end, as I mentioned, was the temple uh, to Mars the Avenger. Um, now, Octavian had vowed a temple to Mars during the battle against the assassins of Julius Caesar at Philippi. But the sanctuary, the actual temple, obviously, was not dedicated until some 40 years later. By this time, Mars had managed to prove himself to be Rome's avenger in lots of other um, uh, encounters, uh, particularly against the Parthians. Um, and that's why the recaptured Cigna, which we saw on the Prima Porta statue, uh, was permanently displayed in this new temple. Identifying Mars with this later occasion, as well as with other deeds of Augustus's armies and generals, 
was a convenient way of forgetting the association with the Civil War. Now, this whole complex was a masterstroke for sending um, important political messages. The overall effect was to present Augustus as the central figure in Roman history, linking past and present, gods and mortals, and to exalt the Julian family above all other families at Rome. It had to be a useful tool to promote the idea that Augustus was Rome's chosen leader. Now, the propaganda campaign that we saw on the breastplate of the Prima Porta is also reflected far and wide on relief sculpture during Augustus's reign. The most important surviving example is the Arapacus, um, the, temp the altar of Augustan peace. It was constructed sometime between 13 and 9 BC and was dedicated on Livia's birthday. The Arapacus consisted of a grand enclosure wall inside which there was a smaller altar raised on a set of steps. The outer walls are about 10.5 metres long and 11.6 metres wide, and it is nearly seven metres high. On these outer walls, Augustus's message of peace and prosperity is clearly on display. For example, this panel on the east side um, has often been thought to portray uh, Tellus or Mother Earth with the two babies in her lap to emphasise her fertility. However, persuasive arguments have been made which suggest that the woman actually represented is Pax or Peace, which is, after all, one of the main themes of the altar. Pax would have made a fine complement to the warlike Roma who is represented on the opposite relief. Now, in this relief, you have a very peaceful and contented sheep and cow that rest below her. We also have personifications of fresh water, indicated by the upturned uh, water jug. Fresh air, indicated by the billowing drapery. And... Um, Fresh, oh, sorry, what was the other one? Fresh, <laughs> fresh water. Um, and, and the sea, sorry, indicated by the waves. I knew it was the waves. I couldn't remember what they were representing. Good Lord. Um, suggests that Augustan peace spread over the entire world. Now, another, I, I always, I, I don't know, I look at these things and just think the people who sculpted them must have been so skillful, really, um, to, actually, to actually do that drapery. It just looks like drapery doesn't look like stone. I see they must have just been so skillful. Okay, another relief on the outside wall of the Arapacus may show Numa Populius, uh, the second king of Rome, or according to the more traditional interpretation, it shows Aeneas sacrificing a salve. Now, Aeneas, uh, we're told, um, had brought the images of the household gods all the way from Troy, and it might be these that we can see in this um, well-built shrine here in the corner. Aeneas is pious, as always, and stands before an altar wearing the toga drawn over his head to indicate that he's acting as a priest, while near him is two wreathed youths who are assisting him with the sacrifice. Now, the salve plays an important part in one of Rome's foundation myths. According to legend, it has been prophesied that Aeneas would know the right spot to found his city when he came across a sow with 30 piglets under an oak tree. The relief then reminds the viewer of Aeneas's piety, of his connections to Troy, and of the foundation myth itself. All of these points were important to Augustus as he claims descent from Aeneas. 
Virgil, a poet writing in the Augustan period in his Aeneid, spells out the family lineage uh, when he has Jupiter revealing the future to his daughter Venus. And he writes, Your son Aeneas will wage a mighty war in Italy. Beat down proud nations, give his people laws. Found them a city, and from this great line will come a Trojan, Caesar, to establish the limit of his empire at the ocean. His glory at the stars, a man called Julius. Now, of course, since Julius Caesar was the father of Augustus by adoption, as well as his great uncle, Augustus could claim descent from this illustrious past. Now, another relief on the same building uh, represents the wolf with Romulus and Remus. Now, as we have seen, this portrayal of the relationship of Aeneas and Romulus to Augustus is closely paralleled in the Forum of Augustus where the statues of Romulus and Aeneas held such prominent positions. Thus, in both the Arapacus and the Forum, Augustus played upon his dynastic relationship to these heroes, thereby confirming his divine and mythical ancestry. Along the sides of the uh, building, we have figures in two processions. Now, one of them shows mostly senators, and the other side shows the imperial family. The two processions show the duality of Roman rule as it was in the Augustan period. We have the Senate on one hand, and Augustus was always careful to pay his respects to the Senate, and the family of Augustus on the other. For the latter, the inclusion of children had a very significant role. This was partly because young people, like Augustus's grandsons Gaius and Lucius Caesar, were important members of the family, representing for Augustus the embodiment of the future of all of his dynastic hopes. Now, we know Augustus not only promoted his family in this way, but he also promoted them very strongly on coins as well. And he promoted the idea that his family was the future of Rome. On the lower registries, um, we have a beautiful floral pattern made up largely of acanthus leaves and tendrils with elegant and realistic flowers. Um, and again, these are another symbols of peace and prosperity. Small animals, and you'll have to take my word for this because I couldn't find a clear enough picture of this, but there are little snakes and things like that in amongst these um, representations, uh, in amongst the foliage. And we have a swan perched on top of the design at various intervals. The swan just happens to be the symbol of Apollo, and is such, again, a reference to Augustus's claim that the god assisted him in his victory at the Battle of Actium. Now, the Arapacus is a public monument that is a propaganda statement for the good image of Augustus. Through myth and allegory and through representation of contemporary events, the viewer is reminded repeatedly of the greatness of Augustus. In one sense, it is meant to be historical with references to real people, but it also carries more abstract messages for peace, prosperity, and the divine origins claimed by the emperor. Now, please remember that really I have only been able to give you a taste of some of Augustus's uses of art and architecture to sell his political message. It is a message that would have been promoted throughout Rome and throughout the empire. To end today, the Oxford English Dictionary defines the word propaganda as, quote, the systematic dissemination of information, especially in a biased or misleading way, in order to promote a political cause 
or point of view, unquote. So is this what Augustus did? Did he employ one of the most sophisticated propaganda campaigns in history to ensure that his new political system, the Principate, was accepted by the Roman people? Now, with that question for you to ponder over a glass of wine this evening, I will end today. Thank you.